Hi everyone, this is Maika Sanderson, the Grant Program Manager. Um, welcome to the Farm to School Grant Team Lead Training. Um, today I'm actually joined by Carla Garcia, Anna Aerosmith, who is the other grant officer that works on the Farm to School Grant Program, is not feeling so well today. So Carla is gracious enough to um, join us. Um, Carla, do you want to give a really quick hello? Yes, hi Maika. Um, thank you. Um, I am Carla Garcia. I'm one of the grant officers at FNS, and I will be walking you through some tips on scoring and some other uh, relevant information as it pertains specifically to the application um, review process itself. So a couple things like point allocation and scoring application and also talking about written feedback and whatnot. Um, so we'll get more into detail on that in a second, or I should say in a few probably about halfway through the presentation. Uh, pleasure meeting you guys. Thank you. Thanks, Carla. All right, everyone. So I'm going to warn everyone now. I hope everyone got their caffeine or their favorite drink of choice. This is going to be a jam-packed presentation, but it's really going to prepare you well for uh, the review period. So let's get started. And I'm going to be speaking faster than I usually do. This is not my presentation style, but I'm trying to keep us to the hour. I think we're going to go over, so I, fair warning on that. But we are recording this webinar, so whatever you miss, um, you may certainly watch at your own leisure um, later on. So really quick housekeeping things. Audio is through your computer, so turn it up, turn it up, turn it up on your speakers, on your computer if you are not hearing anything. If you are still experiencing audio issues, um, go ahead and mute your computer speakers and dial in via the phone. So on the screen right now I have the number as well as the passcode, um, so go ahead and use those details. So I'm going to leave this up just for a few seconds in case there is anyone that's experiencing any audio issues at the moment. Okay, got to keep the train moving, so I'm going to move on. Um, as you may have suspected, um, the lines are in fact muted. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, please go ahead and use that, that chat box that's found in the left-hand corner um, of the screen. The webinar is being recorded. I will be sending the link out after the webinar, um, probably tomorrow morning. Also, I'll be uh, distributing a PDF as the, of the slides as well. And you will be prompted to take a survey after the webinar, so please do. We're always trying to improve the way that we are equipping um, team leads with the information that they need to successfully complete the review period. Um, Abby, I know that you missed the audio information. I'm sure Matt will be able to pass that along to you in the chat box. So in terms of moving forward, um, the agenda for today, we're going to zoom through background information on the Farm to School Grant Program. Everyone should have already seen that from the Farm to School 101 webinar, so just a really quick refresher. Uh, then I'll just give a quick overview of the uh, grant cycle, kind of from that to bolts, um, what does the whole entire cycle look like. Then we're going to deep dive into the review process and what your role is as a team lead and what those expectations are. And then we're going to give an overview of kind of what to expect in your grant application package. What are the different components? Then we'll go through the systems that you'll be using over the next couple of weeks. There are two. Um, in order to download your applications as well as submit your um, comments and scores for each of your applications um, online. Then we'll give you some tips for success on how to craft your, your comments slash feedback for your applications. And then we'll do a recap because I would have gone through a ton of info. So so, um, and then we'll share. We'll have some questions there at the end that you all can can ask us. We'll make time for Q and A. All right, everybody, lock in. Put your seatbelts on. We're gonna go quickly. So, from the school grant program background. Um, you know, the Richard B. Russell National School Lunch Act, Section 243, um, really creates the Farm to School Grant Program, and we, the Office of Community Food Systems, is charged with awarding up to $5 million annually um, to train, provide supporting operations, planning, purchasing of equipment, developing school gardens, um, all um, with the mission of um, launching and expanding farm to school programs and efforts across the nation, as well as hel helping students to better understand uh, where where their food is coming from um, and, and how it impacts their bodies. Um, so the mission of uh, the Farm to School Grant Program is to incorporate and increase access to local foods in the school meals program. 
So in terms of the Farm to School Grant Program, we have several entities um, that um, – several entities that are eligible. So uh, there are schools, state and local agencies, Indian tribal organizations, small to medium-sized agricultural producers, and nonprofit entities are all able to apply for our grant program. I went through a lot of this information on the Farm to School 101. I sent out that link last Friday, so go ahead and check that out for the deets on the specifics around each of the grant types. But for the purposes of today, I just wanted to remind you all that there are three grant types, planning, implementation, training. Um, and so you will be reviewing applications from one of these three um, grant track types. Um, so now we're going to switch gears into just providing you all just a general grant cycle overview. So m maybe many of you already know this, but uh, we uh, announced um, our request for applications uh, back in October. Applications were due December 8th, and now um, during that time we were recruiting reviewers. And then January, um, we're providing training, obviously, like today, uh, to all of our team reviewers and team leads. And we actually will be distributing those applications during this month. The review period will get started at the end of January, starting January 29th, and will go through almost all of February, February 23rd. So then that's where your role as a reviewer will end. You would have submitted all of your comments and feedbacks. And feedback. After that, March through April, that's where we in national office go ahead and kind of take all of the information that you submitted to us, uh, analyze it, and prepare it into recommendations to the selection official in terms of which awards should be selected. Then in May, uh, grants are selected and we announce. Uh, so in terms of the selection process overview, the decision criteria includes um, all that information that you all submit to us, so both those numerical scores and the written feedback. Um, we also take into account geographic diversity. We don't want to select awards all in the state of Texas, so we want to make sure that we are distributing funds um, across the country and touching both rural and urban communities, um, as well as making sure that the final selection list really embodies the FY 2018 priorities that were listed in the request for applications. Don't remember what those are. You don't have to worry too much because we actually implement um, those, we actually look for and apply those priority designations to applications after you all submit your feedback, so you don't have to worry about that as a team leader or reviewer, um, but if you just want to be aware, you can certainly read the FY 2018 priorities in the RFA or, or go ahead and listen to that Farm to School 101. Um, we then go ahead, um, more specifically when we receive your scores, we rank them by order within each grant type. Okay, um, so once we um, have those um, all ranked out, we apply the priorities, we make sure we're um, implementing geographic diversity, uh, we then send uh, that list to the selection official. The selection official will review it, approve it, apply any additional agency priorities, um, and then the, that list is vetted to ensure that, it's com that the, the entities and schools are kind of complying with USDA um, regulations, more specifically schools and school districts as well as state agencies. And then awards are announced in May. Okay, we're going pretty fast. We're now into deep diving the review process. So you're going to really want to key in here because there's going to be a ton of information that's going to be helpful for you as a lead um, as you get started with doing reviews. So team lead responsibilities are to sign and submit your conflict of interest form. Fret not, you all have already done that, so no need to worry there. You could already check that off your list. Um, as a team lead, you will be independently reviewing 10 proposals. So you as a team lead, as well as um, those that are going to be on your team, everyone is going to be reviewing the same applications, um, and it will be around 10 applications. You will then submit numerical scores as well as written feedback um, via um, PartnerWeb, which we'll get a little bit more into. 
As a team lead, which is a unique responsibility, um, you will be monitoring and providing quality control for the feedback that's submitted by your team members. So that means that you are going to be Responsible sounds like such a heavy word, but um, we are charging you <laughs> with ensuring that your team is moving along in the review process, that they're completing their tasks. And so um, one of those key tasks is actually reading their applications and submitting that feedback. So you're going to be taking a look on PartnerWeb um, to make sure that those um, forms are being submitted into the system. And we'll get a little bit into how you would see that. Um, so not only that they're being submitted, but that you would actually take a look, scan through the feedback, and make sure that it complies with the guidelines that we've set out for what feedback should look like. Um, and later on in the presentation, we'll, we'll give you some really great tips on how to craft good feedback. As a team lead, you're also responsible for scheduling and participating in the team review meeting. So a little bit more about that um, later on, but you will be reaching out to your team members trying to schedule a call to talk about your scores. Also as a team lead, you'll be submitting activity checklists for each of the applications that you have been assigned. And then you'll be serving as a general point of contact for your team. So Instead of me reaching out to your individual team members, I'm going to reach out to you if I um, have any questions or find that you know, maybe there are some forms that are missing from a particular team member, I'm going to reach out to you. So you'll be serving as a point of contact. And then finally, um, we are asking both you all and team, team review and reviewers to um, complete a feedback uh, survey in mid-March, um, just telling us about your experience as a team lead so that we can continue to equip you all with the resources that you need um, for future cycles. So let's dive into the review, the review portion of the grant cycle, which is what you all are heavily involved in. So the first thing to note is that you are a team lead, and you are heading up a team of three, including yourself. So you have two team members. Each team is going to be assigned a specific grant type. So you will be, com you will be responsible for reviewing and grading um, applications from a very specific grant type. You won't have planning and training. It will be just planning or just implementation or just training. So the week of January 16th, so we're going through kind of calendar of events, if you will, for the review period. So next, um, so this week, um, we are working on distributing applications to, to you as well as the reviewers. Um, so that should be distributed to you all by end of day Friday, um, but worst case scenario, Monday. And then next week, you're really going to be charged with um, taking a look at those applications, making sure that there aren't any conflicts of interest, logging into PartnerWeb, um, just making sure that logistically everything is um, kind of in place. And then January 29th through the 23rd is the review period. And the review period is actually broken up into two separate um, phases, if you will. So the 29th through the 9th is the individual review period, and the February 12th through the 23rd is the team review period. I see a question in the chat box. Um, Chris, great question. Have you all received your team assignments? No, you have not, but they have been made. And we are going to be emailing you all by end of day today. So you're going to receive an email that says you are on team one. Um, you have been assigned planning grants. You won't know exactly which applications, but um, you'll know what grant type. And then in that email, you will also know who your team members are, um, and you will also receive their contact information. So in terms of preparing for review, um, some things that you can be doing, um, definitely take a look at the FY18 Farm to School Grant Program Request for Applications. I sent that R the RFA along on Friday with the link to the Farm to School 101 webinar. So you, sh you all should already have that. Another thing that you can do to prepare for review is to make sure to familiarize yourself with the reference materials. Um, so that's the score sheet, the point allocation guidance, and projects that involve one-sheeters. You may be saying, hmm, reference materials, did I receive these? No, you have not, um, but you will have these by Monday. Again, next week is like your big gear up for the review period week, and so that's the time where you'll, where you'll have access to PartnerWeb and these reference materials, and you could start taking a look through them. And as I mentioned, 
you want to make sure you're accessing Partner Web and downloading your applications via Watchdogs. Those activities, again, are to be done next week. Okay, so I wanted to make sure that everyone was a little bit familiar with the, the reference materials which will be distributed to you all um, by Monday. So the score sheet, there's a score sheet that you will use in order to evaluate your assigned applications. Um, there, the score sheets are unique to grant track types. So you know the planning grant has its own score sheet, implementation, so on and so forth. Um, on the score sheet, there are various categories by which you are evaluating your applications. For example, you'll be taking a look at need and readiness as well as sustainability, budget, so on and so forth. Um, there are specific bullets under each of these categories that will give you a sense of what you should be looking for as you're reading through your grant application package. On the right of that score sheet, you will see that there is a scale of numbers that also have modifiers assigned to it. Um, so it's kind of to give you a sense of, you know, for each category, um, if I gave it a 12, what could I, is, is that a good score, is it a bad score? So um, as you can see on the right, um, it kind of provides that scale for you so you can kind of have a sense across um, different reviewers um, what that number means. So the point allocation guidance document is an additional document that you should be using while you are evaluating your applications. So you have the numbers which correlate to this rating, but then we also provided you um, kind of a definition of what that rating means. So as you can see here, we've outlined for excellent, very good, good, um, kind of um, a, a, some guidance around what does that mean as you evaluate your um, grant application. And so this particular document is, is really um, helpful in terms of trying to maintain scoring consistency, not just across reviewers, but also across um, teams, which is why we have the rating, um, that definition, as well as providing um, kind of that scale for each of the, the different categories in the score sheet. So one of the things that we wanted to make sure to share with you all this year, um, and this information has been shared with uh, reviewers as well, is what kind of um, uh, counts, if you will, as a high scoring application. I think sometimes folks have a want to just gauge like if I gave this if at the end of scoring my application I gave it a 75, is that good? Is that bad? Do most people get 75s? Like what does it kind of look like? So. Um, we wanted to provide you some stats from FY17. So um, in terms of what was designated as a high scoring application, so when we receive a list of scores, we first determine what constitutes a high scoring application. Once we've determined what a high scoring application is, what that number cutoff is, um, it is from that pool of applications we'll begin to make initial selections from. So um, to give you all a sense, um, here are the average numbers of, of the high scoring cutoff number um, by grant track type. So for planning grants to be, consider, to be considered for that initial selection potentially, you had to have received at least an 88.3. Um, to be clear, this is an average score, so that's why you're getting that decimal point. When you are providing scores on your applications, please do not <laughs> give something a 15.5 out of 20, use whole numbers. Um, so for the implementation grant, um, to be a high scoring app, you have to score at least a 90.7. And then for training, um, the training scale, we, we couldn't provide the average score because last year's training scale was on a scale of 0 to 50, and this year we shifted it to 0 to 100. Uh, so an additional reference material, and this one is unique to team leads, is the activity checklist. Um, so you all, um, you all will um, complete an activity checklist which essentially um, kind of has various categories and lists activities that you may um, see represented in the application that you're, you're scoring. Um, so the thought is as you're reading your application, you um, will complete a paper version of the activity checklist so that you can then transfer that information into the online um, partner web form. So if your application talks about you know, increasing local food 
increasing local pork that you would select the pork box. Um, it's very self-explanatory. But this information is used for us to track trends among um, you know, proposals that we re receive, so we have a sense of what kind of work folks are, are seeking to do across the nation, what, what kind of work have we been able to fund and not fund. Um, and we also use this data to actually uh, prepare a report that is a cumulative review of um, kind of all of that application data that we receive, and that's our summary of awards report that we talked about in the Farm to School 101 webinar. Okay, so indep independent review guidelines. So as I said, the, in the review period is four weeks long, but it's divided into two phases. So the independent review comes first. It's the 29th through February 9th. Um, during this time, you are in a dark closet just reviewing your applications alone. You are not talking to your team members. You're not sharing notes. You're not comparing. You're just using those reference materials to evaluate each of your applications. Um, as I had mentioned on the previous slides, your applications are going to be distributed via WatchDocs. More information on that a little bit later. Um, and we're really asking you guys, it's so important, please skim all your applications once you've received access to it. So we're looking to make sure that everyone has access to the applications by end of day Friday of this week. Um, so make sure by that you are taking a look at this information. Um, and actually this date is incorrect. We want you to do this by um, January 24th, midweek of next week, because that will give us time to swap out applications if you have a conflict of interest. So conflict of interest, you all have submitted your COI forms. Um, but if you just need to kind of jog your memory of what kind of constitutes a conflict of interest, if, if there is someone that is applying for funding um, in which you have a financial interest or can gain from if they were to be funded, um, you're not going to want to be reviewing that application. Or if you have a very strong relationship with a particular institution or organization, you used to work there, you currently work for them quite a bit, um, that also would constitute a conflict of interest. A lot of you have already submitted your COI information to us, so we, dis we have assigned applications to avoid um, conflicts of interest, but you just never know. So take a look at the, application, at the applications as well as the support letters um, just to make sure that there aren't any conflicts of interest. Um, another thing that we wanted to flag um, is that the independent review period ends February 9th, um, but we want to be specific that you should be submitting, not only should you have read your applications, but you should submit that numerical and written feedback via PartnerWeb no later than February 9th, 9 a.m. Um, that is really critical because it will give us a chance to kind of tap Will you all give you all a chance to kind of tap folks on your team um, if they haven't submitted that information? And also, you might be wondering who's looking over your shoulder as a team lead. I will be doing that, <laughs> so I will be checking to make sure that team leads are also complying with these timelines. Okay, so team review um, guidelines. Uh, so this is the second phase of the review period, and that happens from February 12th through the 23rd. So during this time, you as a team lead will be facilitating a group discussion via conference call. Um, so you reviewed the applications by yourself, and so did your team members, and now during that second week, you are going to um, have scheduled a call or several calls to, to talk about your scoring. Um, so it's up to you. Can, you can do one long call, or you, you can figure out a couple of times to talk with folks. Um, I would say that you should allot at least three hours um, for um, these discussions. It really just depends on how much variance there is among your um, among, among the scoring of your applications. Um, on that call, you will be joined by a program rep representative. So it will either be myself, Anna, or Carla. Um, so we'll just kind of be present at the top of the call to, to set the stage a little bit, and then we'll turn it over to team leads to actually facilitate that discussion. Um, we recommend that you email team members as soon as possible, like I say next week, <laughs> um, to start to find times that would work um, during that two-week period. Um, and then by January 31st, uh, we would like for you all to submit 
you know, when are you having your call or calls um, on this Google spreadsheet, which I will send out the link um, outside of the, the slides. So you might be wondering what's kind of going on during the, the team calls. Um, so everyone, including team leads, should come prepared to discuss the score as well as the strengths and weaknesses of each of your um, applications, which is what you have already done during that individual review period. Um, and so based on having that discussion, you may or may not decide to adjust your scores. Um, so, and if you do end up updating your scores, you will do so via Partner Web. In addition, since you as a team lead are responsible for activity checklists, you will also be submitting that um, via Partner Web during this time period. Or you could submit it earlier. Um, again, you all are the only ones that are responsible for it. Um, to make it easier, we are going to make a paper copy available on the Partner Web website so that you can print it out and fill it out, and then just go ahead and transfer that information directly into Partner Web. So facilitating that team review call, um, some folks have often asked kind of like, what's the format? What should I be doing as a team lead during you know, this call if I have to lead it? And so as I said, the program representative will come on and kind of set the stage initially, um, and then you would take over facilitation. And so typically what we have recommended, and you may decide to do it in a different format, but you allocate 10 minutes to initially discuss each of the applications that everyone has reviewed. So you say your score, you do some strengths and weaknesses of the application, and then if you find that there's a high variance for a particular application, we've set that threshold at 10 points or more. Um, you're probably going to want to go more in depth. So you're going to want to then take a look at, all right, well for this particular application, let's go through category by category to find out where we are different. Um, so maybe you gave the budget 2 points and somebody else gave it 10. So you're going to want to discuss why there is that discrepancy. Um, and through that discussion you may discover, hmm, maybe I should give it more points. Or maybe that other person who gave it 10 points will decide to give it fewer points. This is really, uh, you know, people ask, why, why are we having these discussions? Why are we having these calls? And that's because typically it's just natural that some people will grade more harshly than others. Um, so we're really trying to calibrate the scores and make sure that you know, there aren't any ex extreme scoring happening. Um, in addition, what we have found even across individual reviewers is that for the first application you get, maybe you're too lenient or maybe you're too strict. Um, but as you go along to the third and the fourth application, you kind of get your rhythm. You know what you're looking for. Um, but those initial applications aren't, didn't receive that same level of attention or eye or expertise now that you have a rhythm. Um, so again, this, this facilitated conversation is a way to kind of highlight those instances in which you might have been too strict or too lenient in your scoring. Okay. I hope folks are doing okay. Um, so now we're going to shift gears into the anatomy of the grant application package. So you all are going to receive, um, as I said, around 10 proposals. And I wanted to make sure that you all had a sense of kind of what you would be getting in your hands. Um, so we, the grant officers, you know, claps, claps, applause to them, um, did a really fantastic job of consolidating all the different paperwork that's required for an applicant to submit in order to be considered for funding. However, as a reviewer, you don't necessarily need to look at every single document that is in your grant application package. So we wanted to, to flag this for you. So the general order that you see here on the slide is um, the order of the different pieces of paperwork that you'll see in your grant application package. And I just wanted to flag for you all that as a, as a reviewer, as a team lead, you should really be focusing in on the table of contents, the proposal and budget narrative, the resumes, the support letters, as well as optional attachments. And so some folks with optional attachments are really organized and they'll say, you know, from their proposal narrative, they're referencing their optional attachments, like see Appendix A. But for some folks who are a little bit more green at grant writing, they may just attach a bunch of optional attachments, like 
and it, it's like, whoa, here's this presentation. Here's a picture of children. Um, so it will just vary <laughs> what you receive, um, but I just want to make sure that, that you all are taking a look at that. The one thing we wanted to flag about optional attachments is that um, there is a page limit. Um, it's 10 pages. So if you receive optional attachments that go beyond 10 pages, please disregard anything after the 10th page. Um, in addition, you know, the, the number of pages that you receive in your grant application um, can really vary among grant track types. So one of the reasons is because the proposal narrative length is a bit different across the grant types, but also um, the number of support letters can be different as well as the number of attachments that an applicant um, will send along with their package. Okay, so systems that are used during the review period, and there are a couple that you all use. Um, so the first thing is you need to get access to your applications. Again, we are in the process of getting you all your applications. We should have those by end of this week, worst case scenario Monday. Um, gotta love technology. Um, so WatchDocs is the application we'll be using. It's kind of like a Dropbox, if you will. Um, so essentially, we, it's just a secure manner by which we can share these very, very large files with you all. And so um, with WatchDocs, we just want to give you a little bit of um, a heads up of what you can expect. So you will receive a series of emails um, when your applications are, are shared with you via WatchDocs. So the first email that you're going to receive is, an, is a Welcome to Workspaces email. And, and what I have here in quotes is what you'll see in, in the subject of the email. You could ignore this email. Just disregard it. <laughs> the second email that will probably come through um, to your inbox is is um, a, a workspaces verification code email, and this is going to contain a six-digit authentication code. Um, and then the third email is a X has shared a workspace with you. And X will be either Anna or Carla's name. Um, and in that email, you will open it, and you will click the link in there. Um, it'll say Farm to School 2018 folder, something to that variation. Um, a, a tab will open in your browser, and then you will enter your email address, and then you will be prompted by the system to enter a verification code. And that's where you go ahead and reference that Workspaces, workspaces verification code email. Grab it, enter it in that browser, and then you will have access to your applications. Uh, so when you enter into um, WatchDocs, um, you're probably going to see a whole bunch of folders. We actually have 30 teams that are reviewing for us. Um, we have nearly 100 volunteers, um, which is really incredible. So thank you for your time. Um, so you're going to want to hop into your team folder. No snooping around in other people's app application folders. Only go to your team folder. Um, and you can go ahead and open it. One thing that we're asking folks is that if they, if they can, if you can, please refrain from downloading applications to your personal computers. I know sometimes people have various settings in which they're doing their reviews, um, but these should be treated as confidential, these applications. And so we're really trying to limit the places where the data is living. Um, so you can view your applications directly in WatchDocs, or you can feel free to download it to your work computer. Um, but we do ask that at the end of the review period that you delete um, these files and treat them as confidential files. You may also feel free to print them. Be sure to keep your printed applications in a safe place. Um, and then after the review period, please go ahead and shred those applications. Your applications are going to be PDFs. Um, we want to be. We want to make sure that we are securely sharing this information, so we do um, password protect the PDFs. Um, the password will be farm to school, all lowercase, one word, very easy. Another thing we wanted to flag is that the email address I have here on the screen is the one from which you will receive your WatchDocs emails. As you can see, it's that type of email address that could just head straight to your spam folder. <laughs> so if you do not see um, any WatchDocs emails by end of day Friday, um, then you may want to reach out to either Anna or Carla. Um, but before that, check your spam folder to just make sure it didn't get redirected there. Um, in terms of reaching out to Anna and Carla, we are dividing it up by grant type. So you'll see implementation grants. You're going to reach out to Anna if you're having WatchDocs e issues, and then planning or training Carla. 
Um, you will also submit so submitting your scores um, and your feedback. So you're using Watchdocs to get your applications, but then to submit your feedback and your activity checklist, you're going to be using PartnerWeb. Um, PartnerWeb is an online SharePoint site that's actually managed by USDA. So right now, this week, we're in the process of creating partner web accounts for folks who do not have them. If you already have an existing partner web account, you will be able to use that um, account in order to um, participate in the review in the review period. So we're going to go ahead and walk through the system. I have a series of screenshots that should be pretty darn helpful when you actually start logging in next week. Right now we're in the process of updating the Partner Web website. So if you hop in there now, you're going to see a lot of old stuff. So um, I would hold off trying to get in there until next week if you already have an existing account. So the first thing you're going to want to do, go ahead and log into PartnerWeb at the, the website that I have listed here. Your username oftentimes is your first initial and last name for login. Um, for folks who have a common one, maybe you have a number or something that follows this, follows your name, or follows your um, username. Uh, if you have a new account, you will receive an email directly from PartnerWeb containing your password, and your password is going to be zany. It will have colons and lower and uppercase. I'm preparing you. Just, just copy and paste it. Um, but it will come to you via email from PartnerWeb. As I said, we are setting up accounts this week, so you should see those emails start to come through shortly. Um, if you have an existing PartnerWeb account or if you're not sure, you can go ahead and just click the Forgot My Password on this page and it will um, go ahead and send you your password so that you can log in. If you haven't received a PartnerWeb um, email by the end of this week, um, you could also do the Forgot My Password um, and the system will know that your account, ex account exists and it will resend that password to you. Okay, so let's say you have successfully logged into PartnerWeb. This is what you will most likely see. You'll be taken to the lobby of PartnerWeb. So the, where you're going to want to look is to your left under Communities, um, and you'll want to select FM Farm to School Grants, um, and that's how you'll access um, the Farm to School PartnerWeb web page, which looks something like this. Uh, so here is where it will take you. You'll see that there's some general information here in the center, kind of just orienting you to our website and kind of what you're expected to be doing here, um, and a few key dates, which I will blow up a little bit more um, across this week. I wanted to bring your attention to the resources because I know that there's a lot of information, and you know we really want to leverage PartnerWeb as a place where you can access all of those reference materials, links to the website, slides, um, we all want it to live here. So I do send them via email, but they will also live here on PartnerWeb. The next place you're going to want to take a look at is to your left, the left navigation bar. Um, and the first thing you want to do, um, if you have forgotten this information, which as I said, by end of day you will have your team assignments, um, but is to find your team. So you go ahead and click Step 1 in that navigation bar. And you will be brought to this page. And the table here on the left will have a list of all of the FY18 reviewers. This is actually old data from last year, so this will be updated. Um, but you, where this red box is, you'll be, you should click that header and it will alphabetize the list. So you'll be able to more easily find yourself and see like, oh, I'm on Team 1. Oh, I'm not a team lead. I am a team lead. Um, and then if you shift your attention to the right, um, this is where you can identify what specific applications you have been assigned. So Watchdocs is where you actually download those applications, but if you just want a simple list, um, you would find that information here. So to the right you would say, oh, okay, I, I know that, let's say I'm Abby. I'm Abby. I'm on Team 1, so I'm going to click the little plus box that's next to Team 1, and that will expand out and reveal all of the applications that have been assigned to that particular team. So you'll see that um, under Team 1, you will be able to tell what your grant type is. So you're, you're able to find a lot of information on this page. So, so far you're able to find your team number, whether or not you're a team lead, you, and you could find your list of assigned applications as well as your grant track type. 
This is another key piece of information, and you'll need this information for when you submit your score sheet on PartnerWeb, um, is the FNS ID. So right here next to each of the applications is a column for FNS ID. And so you'll want to make sure that when you're submitting a score sheet that you grab the FNS ID um, from this Step 1 page. Um, entering the correct FNS ID is incredibly important for us here in OCFS. Um, at the end of the review period, we would have received almost 1,000 um, score sheets and activity checklists in total. So be a friend of mine, <laughs> and please make sure that you're selecting the correct FNS ID when you're submitting your score sheet. Another piece of information you'll get here is the name of um, the application. And so on your score sheet, we also ask you to enter your, the applicant name. So this is where you can get that information. Um, so please make sure that it matches what is found here on this table. Again, it just makes sorting and analyzing and determining if we have all the information we need so much faster and easier. Okay, uh, so now that we know all of that information, we're going to proceed to step two on the left-hand side. Um, and so I should actually go back. On step two on the left-hand side, um, you would now that you know that you're an implementation grant since you're Abby, you would go ahead and click implementation um, right under step two. So then you're brought to the step two page, um, and this is where you can add a score sheet. And actually. Well, we'll get to that shortly. So this is where you can add a score sheet. So where that red box highlights, you would just go ahead um, and click it. For team leads, you will see underneath that, um, add a checklist. So that option will also be, should also be found on the Step 2 page. So once you click Add a Score Sheet, you are then brought to this page where you should navigate to the top left, and you should click New, and then you should collect click New Item, and that will bring up a new score sheet form, which will look something like this. Um, and so at the top, all that important information that you find on the Step 1 page, this is where it gets entered. So make sure you're entering the correct panelist ID. If you're Abby B, make sure you select Abby B. And it's all, the first three are drop-down menus, um, so just be careful. Folks sometimes select the one before or after them, so just make sure you select the correct one. And then applicant name, make sure you don't have any typos. Um, so there were a lot of typos last year, uh, which, which makes more work for us in terms of cleaning the data. So just make sure that you're typing the same applicant name that's found on page one, or step one. So one of the questions that I get often and is, can I save an incomplete form? Um, in order to submit a form, every field needs to have something in it. So if you want to save it, you need to enter zero or something um, before you can click OK. And once you do that, that form will then be saved. Not shown here, but if you scroll to the bottom, there is an OK button. And once you hit that OK button, your score sheet is submitted. So once you hit OK, you're brought back to this page. Um, and so your, your score sheet will, a list of all score sheets submitted for implementation will be found on this page. Um, so let's say you didn't finish a score sheet, you entered a bunch of dummy data. Um, you would go to this page and click that little paper icon, and that will allow you to open up um, that particular score sheet and update it and click OK so that it will refresh with the new information. And actually here is the same page that you will use um, in order to monitor um, the score sheets that your team is submitting. Um, so that is a really critical piece for you as a team lead. One of the things I wanted to highlight is to more easily find a, a score sheet, you just go ahead and click those headers at the top, um, and it will allow you to sort it. So um, I think sorting by team is probably the easiest, and then you'll be able to kind of see, okay, these are all the score sheets for my team, and you can go ahead and kind of find the ones that you're looking to evaluate. Um, so I kind of went through most of this information on the previous page, but 
not only will you be able to see your score sheets, but to see that of your team members. So by clicking that little paper icon, you can go in and say, hmm, these comments are very brief, or there's nothing but zeros in here. Um, and then you can go ahead and email your team member to make sure that they are um, actually um, making progress on those particular score sheets. All right. We are going to head into Tips for Success, which I'm going to turn over to Carla. Thank you, Maika. And hello, everyone. Once again, I'm Carla Garcia, one of the grant officers at FNS. I'm going to be outlining what a, what a quality review entails. Um, and uh, we do definitely want to make sure that everyone is consistent and you remain uh, and you have an objective review. So I did just kind of want to cover what that entails. Um, and what we look for as far as the, some tips here for success. And as the um, team leads, you guys are going to have a, a few responsibilities, so I want to just make sure that you're aware um, of a few things. Um, obviously, as I stated, we want to make sure that you have an objective review and that it's going to involve a thorough evaluation of the technical aspects of the grant. Um, you want to make sure that the, the evaluation is based on an unbiased appraisal of the merit of the application's response to the criteria published in the respective RFA, um, which would be you know, the RFA. Um, obviously, we've already outlined, and I think Maika's covered some of the point allocation here, which is what you're looking at now. You can see here that we have a range of scores based on excellent all the way through unresponsive. So we have numbers uh, that identify um, the criteria depending on where it falls. So if you, if you have something that's excellent, you've got a 20, whereas if you're looking at a proposal that's unresponsive, you're looking at zero. Um, one of the things we wanted to bring to your attention is that FNS has a policy right now that we have to forward applications um, if they, they might be missing some parts. And so I wanted to make sure that you are aware of that. Um, and and I, I may cover that in a minute, but. I guess I'm bringing this up because there's a section here that says zero, which is unresponsive, and so we want to make sure you score accordingly if you feel that there's something missing. So um, you'll see the zero there, and that would be an example of unresponsiveness. And then you have excellent being a 20. The main thing here is you want to make sure your scores align with your, feed, your written feedback, and I'll be covering that as well. Um, scoring application. So you want to provide a score that, and written feedback for each category. As a lead reviewers um, and, and team leads, you're going to make sure that you have time to review the comments that is, are submitted by your team. So, you know, there's there's going to be some stuff that you're going to have to review when, when that's submitted in Partner Web or, or, or to you, hopefully. Um, the recorded comments should be in the form of strengths and weaknesses, and you will see that set up in Partner Web where you will be able to enter a strength or a weakness. And you're also going to be looking at recording a score that is accurately reflecting your evaluation. Um, so again, just make sure that the score aligns with whatever your comment is saying. So if it's unresponsive, um, you have a weakness there stating that you did not see the information addressed, and that would be unresponsiveness. And, and so there's an alignment there. Uh, another thing we're just reminding you to use the reference materials to help you assign your final score. So. Uh, the, the sheet that was going to be shared by Maika um, that we just shared earlier, and then of course the RFA. There's there's a lot of information. You're going to submit all your comments and scores using Partner Web. So because we're using Partner Web, everything is going to be submitted online to Partner Web. So just get familiar with the site, and if you've already used it, that's wonderful. As far as written feedback. Again, we cannot emphasize enough how important the comments are. These comments are what we have at the tail end of the process. It's also what we take back to take into consideration the selection process. So now it's very important for the selection process all the way to um, the folks that don't make it. So we use it for two processes. Obviously, we are going to count on your feedback. Um, when we're looking at the scores and, and, and breaking points, but also we're looking at feedback as it pertains to debriefing. Um, our applicants always look forward to finding out where they can do better, and so it's imperative that you understand that all these comments will be shared and can be shared um, with the applicant. So we're asking you to uh, 
um, keep that in mind and to understand that um, because of that, we're asking you to just just make sure that you use proper grammar and punctuation, that it's clear so we understand and um, and and to understand that the whole purpose is is because we may use it to um, or we will be using them to improve uh, the future applications for the grantees that come back and ask to be debriefed. Here are some examples of ideal feedback. So we listed out, for example, some strengths here, and then you also see some weaknesses. Um, it's okay to be critical when you're reviewing the, them, but make sure that the feedback is constructive. Um, we want to make sure it's thorough so that it's ideal and, and we know exactly um, what what part may have been lacking or what portion of the grant was, was a wonderful and, and strong um, part. So the example here has the school district um, that had strong community partners and they were ready to help implement the project. And then they went on, they said the district aims to increase the variety of local products to include protein in general turkey and beef. So you can see how they were very specific here. Um, this is a good example of a strength and a good example of how they were specific. So now we've got not only good feedback, but we understand also when we're looking at these and compiling them what the strength of the proposal was. The weakness here um, also is very clear. Um, you can see that they were specific about what portion of the grant was weak. For example, they, they specified supplies and equipment. So we're not wondering what portion of the budget narrative. So again, this is an ideal um, example, and you, can, um, you want to be concise and specific when you're looking at the, 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 the applications, but also when you're typing into Partner Web, we are asking for specific comments to justify your scores. And then, of course, here's an example of less than ideal. Um, what we don't want and what we're asking team leads to kind of flag for their uh, group before you even accept them. So you see someone here wrote, strengths, great. Well, we don't know what is great. And so we obviously want to make sure we have uh, the uh, specific information. And then you've got further information. Good example on page 7. Well, page 7 is a very long page full of lots of information. And unfortunately, we would not be able to take that information to justify a strength without knowing. And you may have had well, well intentioned. So as you're typing, just make sure page numbers are encouraged. Um, but you would want to also maybe include uh, the specific part that was the strength. Again, like in the earlier example, they were specific. Um, and page numbers are encouraged. You just need to, they would just need to elaborate. So keep that in mind. You want to look at it from that perspective. And then you also see where uh, at the top they identified garden vegetables and classroom activities. Um, but they didn't say how this would impact the school. You know, we don't really know how this impacts the project. Um, it's just, it almost looks like just notes. So when you're typing this, make sure it's, you know, uh, complete thoughts. And then there's weaknesses here. Seems like a waste of funds. Well, that's not very nice, and, and that's not very objective. So we want to make sure that, you know, we remain objective throughout the process as well. Um, let's keep going. And then, of course, before you submit, um, after you've had time to think through your applications, um, you, there's a few things you want to do. You kind of want to pause and reflect. Um, and here are some things you can go back and check. Um, so we're encouraging everyone to go back and then check at that point to make sure it's, your feedback is grammatically correct, um, you have appropriate punctuation, make sure it was clear and actionable, that it's not offensive, um, that the feedback reflects that you've closely reviewed the materials submitted by the applicant. And you also want to be checking to make sure the feedback aligns with the amount of points deducted. So um, as, as you know, in the RFA, we also have a range of scores per section, so you can definitely check the numbers and just make sure that it falls within that range. Um, and then look back at, at that sheet of, of range for what it looks like to be an excellent applicant versus someone who just is at a zero because they didn't provide feedback altogether or maybe somewhere in the middle. So make sure you're consistent across the board as you're looking at your application. So we've also um, identified some examples of what a bad, um, I guess, uh, feedback would look like. So some folks, someone might write, for example, this section is vague and lacks details. Um, again, we, that's a bad example. We we'd certainly want to know exactly what it would be exact, uh, and what it entails. So OK would be along the lines of 
Um, you would need more details needed to justify how each budget line was arrived at, especially travel and equipment, equipment sections. And then you have an excellent one. You can already see from the excellent one that it's very thorough, it's longer, um, it's, you know, it's concise, it's, it's precise. We know exactly what was excellent about this project. Um, they identified that they're talking about the budget line items. They're talking about travel and equipment sections, so we know exactly where to go. Um, and then they have a, cons you know, travel costs appear to be excessive, it says here, and equipment to be purchased for kitchen is not specific, and a justification was not included. So it sounds like a weakness, but again, it's clear as to why they would have deducted points. And then personal costs for the farm to school staff position appear to be too low to attract and hire a qualified individual. So again, it's excellent, not that the project is excellent, but that you see that it's thorough enough that you would walk away with a weakness um, and, and be able to justify that score if, it, if the score is low. So again, you want to make sure not only this is a feedback example, and it, we're just giving you an, an example of what a weakness would look like here in this case. Um, the feedback examples, again, um, don't be mean. Um, please don't be rude. Um, be clear. We want to make sure we have a fair and consistent process. Um, and that we're objective. Again, we're all professionals. We want to make sure that this is good feedback we can take back to a grantee. Um, again, just keep in mind all your comments are open to the public. We can share them with them, um, and we will be sharing back feedback with the grantees. Here's an example of a mean one. The sustainability plan is weak. It appears that they believe everything will just work once they get the ball rolling. It is a bit too simple for the reality of a project like this. So again, just remain objective. Um, we want to give them feedback on what we ask them to submit. Um, a nice, <laughs> and that's where we want to be, we want to be nice, proposals would be strengthened with clarification of how ongoing support of a project goals will be managed after the grant has ended with state and local funding. So again, we, that's where we need to be. Um, and, and as a lead, you want to make sure that the conversation also stays you know, um, professional uh, along the, the lines of nice and, and objective. Reviewing the budget and budget narrative. So this is a section that we sometimes get a lot of questions on and folks aren't sure what to do when they get in here. Uh, again, remain objective. Just, uh, you know, understand that we did ask them to submit a budget narrative, so um, you're looking for these things. It should be there. Um, you want to discuss all the items listed on the itemized budget. Um, these are these are the things that are, you should include the evaluation process. Budget estimates are reasonable, so you know you, you can use kind of common knowledge. If it's a, I'll, I'll give you an example: a computer that's five thousand might send the red flag, you know, versus something that's more reasonable where you could say, oh, it's you know one hundred or 300 is a laptop, but then they have to justify it. So that's all we're looking for. We're, we're, you know, if you see red flags, we are asking you to flag us, um, but we're not asking you to go through and, and do a, a full-blown um, cost principles check. Um, that is something that we will do on our end. Um, expenses align with project goals and objectives. This is key. This is where you will come in because you are making sure that the narrative supports all the costs proposed um, to the um, the budget and to the grant. So if you see something that is not aligning with the goal and objective, I think that's something that you can certainly flag for us so that we, we know. And um, and then budget narrative should justify costs if key partner receives portion of funding. Um, a couple of things we wanted to let you know is we're asking you not to dedu deduct the points but flag the following information. Um, we did ask the grantees to come out for the farm to school face-to-face -face meeting. We're not going to take the points off, but we are asking you to flag it because, once again, it is a requirement of the grant. Um, if you notice a discrepancy in budget numbers, again, something major, right, then, yeah, that might, that might be where they're way off, but, um, and we need to know that for sure. Um, but I, I would say at that point you would use your, your knowledge um, and judgment. But if it's, it's something minor, right, we can certainly go back. We will be crunching the numbers at the end and, and checking that. Um, and we're not asking you to determine if the item is allowable, but if you have any questions, again, um, myself, Carla, and Anna will be here for that particular process. Key steps for successful review. So again, once you receive your partner web username and password, you need to make sure you can log in successfully by January 24th. Um, and if needed, you're going to contact um, our Farm to School um, email for help. So when in doubt, remember that 
that that is a really great <laughs> go to um email address for just about everything if you don't remember who to contact um all of us will be checking that as well and then scan your applications including support letters for conflict of interest and completeness by January 24th so again just some key dates i think um some of them may have already been covered but just you want to make sure as a team lead that these things are being done. It's almost like a checklist. If you identify issues, um, this, these are some of the things you're checking. And then during the individual review, you want to allocate at least two hours per application and spread them out across the period. So in order to be successful, we're just make, you know, make sure when you get the applications you have enough time to review all of them. And then complete your independent reviews by February 9th. So. That's the expectation of the date. Um, keep in contact with us throughout. If anything happens, you know, we are asking you to let us know as soon as possible. We understand that things do come up, but the sooner you let us know, the better. Um, and then be reliable. Be responsive to scheduling requests and prompt about notifying team leads um, of time conflicts. And be open to the opinions of others. This would be especially applicable during the review process where Everyone has different feedback. Um, you certainly want to make sure that everyone has the um, um, feels open to sharing their ideas, but also that the main thing also is that you make sure that they are their objective. Um, if you decide to revise the score based on the team discussion, um, and this is usually very, um, uh, it, it does happen. We're asking that you update this in the um, in Partner Web. And this would be like your strength or weaknesses. So if you change your score, um, that would be one of the instances where you would be, um, you know, updating in Partner Web. And I think some of this is very similar. So just so you know, it's here. It's a lot of the stuff that we already covered about being successful as a reviewer. So that is it. And without further ado, I'm going to pass this on to my colleague, Maika Sanderson. And thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Carla. That the, what Carla shared is kind of like, if there's anything to take away from today, it is that it is so key. And you know, the the work that you put into to determine these scores and write that written feedback, it, it's not just for you know to sit in government archives never to be seen again. About 40% of um, applicants request that feedback. And so we go in and pull it and so it being in tip top shape is really critical um, in terms of making sure that we can get this information out to folks. So I know that we are five minutes over time and I want to make some space for Q&A. So I'm going to just a handful of slides left and it's really the easy stuff. So um, how to ask for help. Um, so just to make sure that um, everyone knows kind of who to reach out to for what, if you have problems with partner web, so submitting your scores, adding a score sheet, adding a checklist, you can't find the link, um, being able to see other people's score sheets, um, you're, going, you're going to want to reach out to the Farm to School uh, contact address first, so farm to school at fns.usda.gov, and we will assist you. And if it's beyond us, um, we will then reach out to the folks at Partner Web or direct you to them. If you're having issues with watchdogs, as I had described earlier, if it's implementation, you reach out to Anna. If it's planning or training, you'll reach out to Carla. And then issues with conflict of interest. So if you um, have skimmed your applications next week and on the 24th you're like, man, ah, I have a really you know close tie with so-and-so, please reach out to the Farm to School um, inbox. Um, what will happen is, and I saw this as a question in the chat box, is that we actually will swap out that application. So let's say it happened in Team 1. Team 1 will no longer be assigned that application, and I need to find another application with which we can switch. Uh, switch. So some folks, um, I think there was another question, folks were like, man, that's not a, a lot of time to, to take a look at your applications. Well, we're not asking you to fully read your applications by January 24th. We're literally asking you to skim the proposal narrative like with your eyeballs, like just take a quick look at the support letters and just see if there are any conflicts of interest that drop out, uh, jump out at you. So just taking a look at the names of organizations. Um, again, it's just that once the review period start, it starts, it becomes much more difficult to swap out applications because people start to read it. They start to score it. And it really stinks to have an application taken away from you if you already 
read through half of it. So we're just trying to address all of that as soon as possible. And by identifying it by the 24th, it gives our team enough time to figure out a switch that can work um, because other people have other conflicts of interest. So we don't want to swap and create another COI issue. Um, so how to receive speedy assistance. So just make sure that you know in your email that you clearly state your issue and that you know and provide your team number and grant type. We can look it up on our end, but it just saves a step um, and just makes it a much smoother um, kind of process. And then if you're having issues with things like watchdogs or, or partner web, it's really, really helpful to attach screenshots. So go ahead and just attach a screenshot um, so that we can see exactly what you're talking about. You guys are doing great. I just wanted to give everybody the thumbs up. You made it. We are basically at the end. So essentially I just wanted to recap some really quick high-level things so you know um, kind of next steps. So uh, some key dates to keep in mind. Now you can be reviewing the RFA. You will shortly know your team number and your grant type, so that will allow you to really focus in on the parts of the RFA that talk about your specific grant type. Um, January 22nd through the 24th, so that's next Monday through Wednesday, um, we ask that you make sure that you log into PartnerWeb, make sure you can get in there, that you download your applications or access your applications from WatchDocs, and that you just skim your applications, including those support letters, um, just to check for any obvious conflicts of interest um, so that we can address them um, next week before the official review period begins. Um, so a key thing for team leads, you need to uh, get on the calendar and let us know um, when you're going to have your team call or calls um, during that second uh, review period. So by January 31st, let us know. So I'll be sharing out a Google spreadsheet where you can enter that timing um, so, that, so that we can make sure a program representative is on the line for your very first call. Um, by February 2nd, we recommend that team leads hop into PartnerWeb and start to just make sure that their um, team members have started to submit their score sheets. And if you're not seeing any, that you reach out to them and just make sure that they're on track. Um, oftentimes people will fill out the paper applications before they actually submit it on PartnerWeb, but nonetheless we just want to make sure that folks aren't waiting to the last minute to review uh, their applications. By February 9th, you as a team lead should have reviewed all 10 of your proposals and submitted your scores and your comments via PartnerWeb. You should have followed up with your team members and made sure that they did the same. Um, February 12th through the 23rd, you're actually facilitating your, your mega call or your series of calls to discuss your applications. And then by February 23rd, you and your team members should have adjusted scores if there are any adjustments to be made. Um, and comments and make sure that they're submitted via PartnerWeb. And then last but not least, we certainly want to hear from you. We want to know what your experience was like. We want to know how we can make it better. So we would love that you submit that reviewer feedback survey um, by mid-March. Okay, so at this time I'm going to open up the floor to questions. So if folks have any questions, uh, please go ahead and put it in the chat box. Um, I'm going to take a look here. I think a lot of these I answered, but folks were asking what happens if a team member has a conflict of interest? Would the entire team need to swap out that application? And yes, yes they would. Um, someone had commented that it seems like it's a short turnaround time to, to kind of scan those applications. Um, and kind of do those preliminary actions, but it's just so that we, we here at the Office of Community Food Systems and uh, the grant officers have enough time to act on your issues and troubleshoot them before the review period starts. Um, I have a question here from Diana. Will team leads be able to see team members' scores when they submit them? Yes, they will. Um, I kind of covered that during the partner web uh, portion of the training, so you could just go ahead and view that on the recording. Um, but if you're still having trouble finding it, feel free to reach out. I have a question here that says, do we write the flag discrepancy or other items in the comment section? So I believe that Michelle was referring to um, kind of those don't take off points but flag um, tidbits that we had on the budget. 
And so yes, uh, you would enter those flags in the comment section. Um, and then I have another question here. Uh, as a team lead, will we be able to see the scores that the team member submitted? I just shared on that. In the past, team members have been hesitant to tell others the score they submitted, but happy to share their comments. Um, it was, okay, so Michelle, I will follow up with you more generally about that. In terms of facilitating the team call, it is important that um, on that call that each person shares what their score is because the whole point of the, that team call is to figure out, you know, are the scores very different? And if they're very different, you all as a team should get on the same page at least cognitively about why it's different. Um, if you're using the scoring sheets, there really should be um, there really shouldn't be a huge range in in the scoring for a, p a particular application. So I really encourage people. It's required that each person say what score they gave, so that we can make sure that we're consistently. Um, kind of evaluating each of the applications. If someone's giving an application a 50 and someone else is giving it a 90, that is not good. <laughs> we need to get to the bottom of it and, and calibrate that scoring. Um, so it, it's important that you all are specific during that, that facilitated team call. Um, in terms of the slides for this presentation, yes. I will definitively share out the slides so everyone can uh, reference it for kind of what good feedback looks like and kind of the partner web and the watchdocs um, information. So I will make sure to share out uh, the slides with folks as well as the link. I have another question here. Um, it states, is there a process in place for replacing reviewers if someone becomes unavailable, unexpected leave, sickness, etc.? Um, yes. Fantastic question, and we do. Um, so what's really great, folks are super passionate. Um, we have um, kind of um, a handful of folks that are at the ready um, to jump in if someone is unexpectedly unable, no longer able to um, participate as a reviewer. So yes, I do have some folks as backups who have already attended the trainings. Um, they're going to have partner web accounts. I'm going to make sure that they are, are ready um, to review should they um, be called upon to do so. Um, I have another question here. Do you have to have a comment for each section of the scoring sheet? Great question. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. You must, for each category in your score sheet, submit a numerical sco score as well as a comment both in the weaknesses and strengths section. So you may be asking, but what if I gave it you know, 10 out of 10? Do I have to put a weakness? The way the form is set up, um, yes, if there's an empty box, you will not be able to submit the form. So you should just, um, if, if you've given a perfect score in the weakness, you can put N slash A or no comment. Um, you could just enter something in that box so it's clear that you know, it's so that you can submit the form. But I encourage folks that if you are deducting points, you have to put a weakness. Like that I saw quite a bit last year where folks would deduct, you know, three points and then not put any weaknesses. So you, you have to back up your actions, both good if you're giving a perfect score. You've got to put some information in the strengths as to why it's good and vice versa. If you're deducting points, you have to tell us why. Um, and so the other thing I really wanted to drive home in supporting what Carla said about the feedback is um, it's not just that this feedback um, is available to the public so we should make sure that you know it's comprehensive. People at the end of the day really want this funding. And if they don't get this funding, they want actionable feedback, specific things that they can work on and change in their application to make it better for next round. So when they receive feedback that says things like budget vague, it, okay, great, I have to put more, but what? What part of the budget, budget was vague? What would have strengthened it? So think about it from the perspective of the applicant. If you were to receive your feedback that you wrote, would you be able to take action on it? Would it be helpful? Can I? can I create a better proposal based on what you have said to me? So that should be your guiding principle as you're crafting your feedback. Okay, I am not seeing any more questions. Um, okay, I see one here from 
Gerilyn, um, so what has been the most effective method of creating calls with reviewers to discuss scoring, due to poll, et cetera? Will we receive email or phone info of reviewers, or do we gather that from PartnerWeb? Um, so in that team assignment email, we actually will specifically provide to you um, the, the email addresses of those that are in your your team. Now, if you are having trouble reaching your team, please contact Farm to School. We asked everyone to provide us with backup phone numbers, so we're happy to give you phone numbers if email is not working in terms of reaching someone. Um, and I have heard oftentimes that folks are in fact using um, DoodlePoll to kind of determine times to have their call. Um, but people are free to determine how they want to kind of get that that call or call on the cal call or calls on the calendar. Okay, I think we I think it is finished. Um, Thank you so, so much to each and every one of you. Honestly, the success of our program and being able to uh, make good selections really hinges on your participation, your passion, your attention to detail, and your willingness to volunteer with us. So we thank you, thank you, thank you for um, being willing to um, support the mission of the Office of Community Food Systems by contributing to the grant program in this way. So I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day. You will be receiving a number of emails from, from us over the next few days. Um, so be on the lookout. Um, and I'll certainly send these resources to you all in terms of this webinar and slides shortly. All right. You all have a good day.